Hello everybody, Ben Woodruff here with another falconry video. Today's video, I am up in the mountains of northern Utah. It's way darker than it looks. Uh, I'm under the shelter of some spruce trees and some fir trees. So uh, I don't know if you can see in back, it's actually snowing pretty heavily, which I decided to come up in this weather because I love it. There's something special and magical about comfort versus against the backdrop of discomfort. So what I mean is we spend our lives, uh, you know, in these air conditioned or heated homes and cars, you know, we always try to be well fed, you know, oh, gotta have three meals a day and gotta have snacks and stuff. You go work in an office building and they have snacks and candy in case you get hungry and you, they got a coffee maker for everybody available. And that's great. And I think that's wonderful that we are at that place in many parts of the world. Uh, however, I have found that there's nothing better than being warm when it's cold. For example, there's nothing, it's just a wonderful thing. Uh, I love being out in the cold and having a nice cup of hot chocolate or a nice fresh meal cooked in a Dutch oven when it's cold outside and you're bundling up. So I'm here wearing my alpaca wool poncho and my alpaca wool gloves. Love it. and. I'm up here in an area that traditionally this particular forest is ridiculously productive biologically speaking. This particular area normally in years past has had two goshawk nests, two sharp shinned hawk nests, and a cooper's hawk nest, and a great horned owl nest, and some years a third sharp shinned hawk. It's had that for years and years and years, but the past maybe 10, 11, 12 years, it has not. Uh, those numbers have gone down radically. And so I wanted to talk about predator-prey dynamics. And I think it's good to understand. I hope you can hear in the background some tree squirrels. We've got uh, a few species of tree squirrels here in Utah. And these tree squirrels are a food source for many raptors, but it's not what really drives predator-prey dynamics. So if you're just getting into falconry, you're probably learning about the birds themselves and about the sport, the history, the equipment, the how-to. How do you train a bird? How do you get it to fly free? How do you get it to come back to you? How do you get it to pursue prey? Uh, all of these things, these are all factors um, that, are, that are normal. This is just part of the process when you first uh, get into this sport. But as you're in it longer, you begin to learn about the animals in a much deeper way. And you start to learn the predator-prey dynamics. You start to see the patterns and you start to understand them better. And people otherwise just, they just encounter an animal. They're just driving along and hmm, there's, there's a red-tailed hawk. Ooh, we saw a hawk today. Ah, how great is that? Mm, oh, okay. We didn't see any deer this time in the mountains. Huh, yeah, just didn't see any, didn't really think anything of it. It's almost like you just are barraged by random encounters. And if you don't have those random encounters with wildlife, you don't think about them. Uh, it's just a neat thing if you do, but that is not how it goes. Predator prey dynamics, um, they shift constantly and outside factors can change the normal things. Nature is always in balance. You know, things can seem out of balance. No, it's out of balance from what you're used to or what is considered to be normal, but it's not out of balance. There is no waste in nature. Anytime you have anything you have, I mean, I brought this over in a video the other day in California, there's tree squirrels that are starting to uh, hunt voles and mice, kill and eat and hunt them and being carnivorous. Uh, so whatever they're not getting from their environment and there's a plethora of rodents, so they're turning on that and taking advantage of that food source. You will always have that. I remember in a neighborhood I was growing up in, well, that my best friend was growing up in, uh, and I'd always go hang out over there, and there was a pair of red-tailed hawks, and there's these really productive fields, but they started building houses all over those neighborhoods, uh, you know, all around these farm fields, I mean. And what it resulted in is the red-tails left. They couldn't handle that level of disturbance. However, ravens could and ravens moved in and for the ravens there were these huge productive fields filled with voles and gophers that were having a big population boom 
and so they started hunting so you had these ravens that were being active hunters like all of their meals we photographed and filmed their nests their nest uh it was up in a big old radio tower and watched them and time after time they were just bringing back voles and gophers voles and gophers and feeding them they're catching them live and they were being very predacious where a lot of times we think of ravens as being more scavengers there is no waste in nature anytime there is a change um it'll 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 go through with everything so let me give you an example in this area here this particular forest the predation uh going up the food chain with the raptors in this particular forest is governed entirely by you winter ground squirrels now you winter ground squirrels hibernate for the winter you can probably hear the tree squirrels barking there uh, i am actually right right next to a spot where where there's a fir cone midden where where uh, these tree squirrels have buried all these uh these fir cones to go and, and eat them in the winter and eat out the seeds uh, so they store they, they they power through the winter so they provide a food source in theory for any hunters that are up here but the ground squirrels the ground squirrels are only out in the summer and usually about like by the first week of september they uh they go and they hibernate and they normally have a pretty healthy population a lot of people here in the inner mountain west call them pot guts uh but it, it's you into ground squirrels there's a few other species of ground squirrels as well but these things they'll have a population boom and and this is true particularly in utah and nevada you see this being the case with our goshawks our goshawks base their entire breeding cycle off of you into ground squirrels coming out of hibernation and having new offspring they base their entire nest cycle of what they're going to eat and feed their babies on them being present and if they are not present, the goshawks are still here, but they have to shift what they are hunting. So now, these, these uh, you went to ground squirrels are a piece of cake to catch. They're, they're dumpy, they're cute, they're, they're fat, they're, 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 they get, they get very, sorry, I got snow like <laughs> bombarding me in the face, uh, keeps hitting my nose. These ground squirrels, they just, they, um, they're pretty easy to, to hunt because humans feed them. They're always around the parking lots. You can watch my videos on finding goshawk nests and it talks about this more. So when that is gone, then suddenly if there's something that happens, for example, let's say there's um, populations go up and down. So you can just have the ebb and flow. Okay, maybe the populations go down, but let's say bot fly, bot fly larva spread through. So they all get bot flies, they get diseases and die, or some other disease races through all the ground squirrels. And they're almost not there. You know, there's a few of them still here and there, but there's not just this consistent population. Like think about, think about the grizzly bears. Grizzly bears, the salmon, when they spawn, they swim up river and the grizzlies depend on that. They know, hey, I've got to be here. I have to be able to be at the right place in the right time to get enough salmon to fatten up enough to be able to make it through this harsh winter. It's the same thing. Goshawks know, hey, you know, I gotta, you gotta key in on these winter ground squirrels. When they're gone, remember, a predator has to hunt every day of its life. I mean, big predators might, you know, a cougar might make a kill once every three days, two, three, four days. But other than that, most predators have to kill every day, sometimes several times a day every single day and the normal standard is uh normally it's like one in ten like one out of every ten attempts to try to capture prey results in success this is hard and so if you have a good way to raise your young and now that way is gone mm, that's rough that's sorry i got an alpaca hair in my mouth that's really rough and you gotta switch you gotta find something else to eat anything anything to eat Tree squirrels are a lot harder. Tree squirrels bite harder. They're harder to catch. They're more nimble. You got to dive through the trees and get them. Uh, hunting birds also. Again, if you're trying to feed, you know, three baby goshawks, God, that gets that gets tricky really fast. Um, so you also have this problem down in our valleys where if you have a population shift like we normally always have jackrabbits and cottontail rabbits in our deserts here in Utah. And in our mountains as well, we have snowshoe hares right around here. But what will happen is those populations go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And the amount of precipitation directly affects that, uh, depending on how much grazing there is for them to eat. But then if you have something happen, like the rabbit, 
rabbit, rabbit hemorrhaging disease that has just ripped through all of the country and several other countries as well. It's wiping out tons of rabbits. So then you have foxes, coyotes, badgers, golden eagles, red-tailed hawks. They have all these kind of predators that would normally be going after and hunting uh, those rabbits, they, rep they rely on it. Golden eagles especially, I mean, they just, that's what they choose. And so in the absence of that, they suddenly have to start hunting other prey. So, you know, whatever you can hunt, whatever is out there, uh, you're going to go out, you know, we always say golden eagles often start to switch from uh, targeting jackrabbits as their primary food source to going after sage grouse. And then that starts to make sage grouse numbers go down. Uh, they'll also go after other predators. That's when you see golden eagles hunting things like foxes and antelope and even deer, young deer, that they'll target them and just, you know, tackle them, keep chomping on them until eventually they're dead harsh times uh, and these things always happen these things always uh, rip through an ecosystem and it shifts to where eventually you will uh, snow's really coming down now i wish you could see it oh uh, i'll probably get some shots in a second showing the other angle because it's just it's magical it's beautiful up here but eventually what will happen is uh, a lot of predators will not will not breed because um, especially for a female, the idea of ha being pregnant with either eggs or, you know, in the case of mammals, you know, with, with offspring in, in your uterus, the idea of taking the caloric value to start to try to build something that either isn't going to make it full term because you can't find enough food or worse yet, uh, if you give birth to like a, you know, cougar cub and you can't find enough food for yourself to be able to produce milk to feed your offspring, that was a waste of caloric values and a waste of natural resources. So many predators in that situation will just either die, migrate, move out of the area, or they will just choose to not breed. And I hardly ever see golden eagles these days where I used to see them almost every day. These shifts then eventually leave a landscape quite void of predators. And what that happens is it allows the prey to bounce back. Whatever prey is there or whatever prey can move into that area. So for example, in our deserts, we have had, you know, coyotes have been rock bottom. Uh, golden eagles have been nowhere to be seen. And the badger population, fox population, almost non-existent out there. And so you just have these seas of sagebrush with nothing in them. Well, the first thing that we've seen, it's two years ago, we started to see the, um, the uh, kangaroo rat population start to do, 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 grow back up and not many things are going after them because there's not many predators around. So this year, those do, 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 have ratcheted up to the next level and we're starting to see rabbits again. Um, so eventually these will get in enough that wandering predators coming into a set territory will find that and will predate. And so this cycle will go up and down and up and down again. Now, big things like overhunting by humans or unexpected diseases like avian flu or West Nile virus or the rabbit hemorrhage diseases these things really screw things up uh, but they do that but it's still part of the natural order whatever space there is there's no gaps there's no gaps no resource goes unutilized all the way down to the microscopic level uh, decomposers to the my, I, you've seen my videos if you watch my goshawk nest hunting video when I show the carpenter ants breaking down the dead trees and then the mushrooms eating the inner part of those dead trees breaking them down decomposing them to soils that then new trees who have stripped out all the nutrients from that area and they're the ones that died it becomes new nutrients and new trees that fall down seeds and you know can grow into a new forest so it is all a cycle we as humans like to change the world to our way we want it to be our way we want it to be the temperature we like we want food sources and resources and certain wildlife whether you're a hunter or you just like to see animals in the wild we like to have very specific um which is very specific balances uh, that cater to us but that is not nature the tricky thing as a falconer is finding a way I grew up hunting rabbits with my birds and rabbits have been so low the past years that it's been very, very hard. Uh, and so get your bird out and still fly and find whatever prey you still can 
and be judicious and thoughtful in what you pursue. Uh, there is honestly a lot of prey items that you can do catch and release, and there is something to be said for that. If you're buying frozen quail that you can, you know, from a bird farm to feed your bird, you've got the food either way. If your bird catches a rabbit, trade it off really quick. Rabbit's got a couple of ouches in its bum, but it's okay. Let it go, let it go free. Let it go live its life and either help to uh, breed and pass on its lineage or you know, or it's just the fact that it can be food for a predator to keep that balance. So dancing this dance can be, take a while to learn, to watch, to see, to observe, but do not ever just assume that species will always be there. Uh, I watch on Steve Shingren's channel, um, uh, today I was watching one of his, we're looking up for, uh, um, for deer falcon nests up in Alaska where he had gone, you know, years earlier and he was checking some of the iries and a lot of them were not in use. Uh, but the, the situations around there with prey base had also altered. And so these things shift, they go back and forth and they move, they wax and they wane. And it is all part of the dance of the natural world. Um, I hope to see, still in my lifetime, my region um, explode again with, with biomass. I hope to see tons of wildlife. Oh my gosh, you guys, I wish you, I, I should be turning the camera around. It's just so beautiful seeing these sheets of snow cast through the fir trees and the spruce trees. So beautiful. But anyways, I hope to see this again, but either way, Every part you have, every wave has an up and a down, and this is part of it. it. Is prey base and the relationship between predator and prey will always wax and wane, and will always go up and down. Understanding that can help us make wise decisions in what we hunt and how we hunt. What we do? Are you going to take multiples, or are you going to maybe you know kind of hold back and not go after so much prey? depends on what you're doing and it depends it's good to know the balance and to know the predator prey dynamic in your area and understand just how this all moves so anyways I just wanted to think on that thought today because I, I recorded a video in this forest the other day uh, for the channel and I remember just thinking like oh geez that, you know there's a goshawk nest over there there's a goshawk nest over there and you know, super sharp and scooper like all these things where are they currently well there's no waste of nature and eventually the populations will rebound back and you will have this this forest will be overrun with uh predatory birds once again so it's just part of the cycle and until then you see them here and there uh but they are few and far between because the resources are few and far between so there is no waste in nature and that is the way of things so I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you liked it, if you'd hit subscribe, I very much appreciate it. It helps me keep this channel up and going. If you have any questions or comments or want to collaborate on any videos, uh, just uh, send a message to benwoodrufffalconry at gmail.com, and I'll get to those as soon as possible. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed seeing me freezing my butt off out in the snow. And as always, happy hawking. Mm -hmm.